Hello, and welcome to the Natural State Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Anthony Gustin. It is my belief that the natural state of any living organism is health, and that our artificial habitat has forced us into having artificial health problems. This show is my attempt to dive deep and learn about using nutrition, sleep, movement, relationships, and more to help you reclaim your natural state of health in a modern world and show you how to thrive in an environment that's stacked against you. If you enjoyed today's show, you can find out more details and information at dranthonygustin.com. Today, I welcome Monsal Denton, who was very instrumental in me starting to hunt for the first time. So if you guys tune in, you know, in the past, there are, you know, profiles and stuff, the episode with Jesse Griffiths, who took me on my first hunt. Um, I was actually supposed to go on my first hunt with Monsal. He is the one who I, you know, when I first moved to Austin, he chatted with me a lot about what he calls ethical hunting. So he actually has an email ser- series that we talk about that I got, you know, it's dozen plus emails talking about his approach to try to get people who really care about where their food comes from and want to participate in the food system instead of just, you know, be a blind participant to it. And so, yeah, he, he is very, very mindful. He's one of the most mindful people I know. And I mean, if there's like, we're walking around and I point to the ground, I go, oh, what is this plant or what is this animal, a bird, a bug? And he knows immediately. This guy is very, very connected to um, the world around us. And he has a lot of wisdom. And he's one of my go-to people when I have any questions regarding sort of spirituality, around hunting, ethical things. Um, just an amazing guy with a really interesting background. So tune into this one and I hope you guys enjoy. This episode of The Natural State is sponsored by NED. NED is an incredible company that makes a lot of CBD products. And you guys can probably go back to some of my episodes and realize that I have been a CBD skeptic for a very long time. I think that it's really hard in this industry that's exploding to have really high quality products that actually do anything. I tried a bunch of different CBD brands before this one, and unless they had THC in them as well, not enough to get high, but just enough to amplify the effects of CBD, I didn't feel anything until I tried Ned and then was completely blown away. I'd been using their products before they sponsored the show for about four to six months and have noticed a huge increase the nights that I use their product about 25 milligrams so 50 milligrams per night of the cbd and i sleep way better but then also the most interesting part is my hrv as tracked by my aura ring the next morning is about 20 points higher the day that i use cbd versus not i also have not been doing a lot of social drinking as of this year so anybody who's been following my stuff knows that i'm sort of been taking the backseat to any sort of glass of wine here drink there to take the edge off. And the last few months, you know, I'm sure everybody in the world feels a little stressed out. And I've been doing the same amount, like 25 to 50 milligrams to sort of replace that glass of wine to wind down and de-stress. And it's been pretty remarkable to pull down the edge and make sure that I can just like calm down at night with all that's going on in the world. The founders are amazing people. They really care about their supply chain, their sourcing, they do things the right way. And I asked them to hook you guys up with a little bit of a discount code. So if you want to try Ned out, just go to helloned.com slash AG15 for 15% off in free shipping. That's H-E-L-L-O-N-E-D.com slash AG15. That's AG15 for 15% off in free shipping. This show is also brought to you by Alatura Naturals. When I considered sponsors for the show, I reached out to Andy, who is the founder of Alatura, and pretty much begged him to support the show just because they are the only products that I trust to put on my skin. So much garbage is in skincare products that it blows my mind. I cannot find any other products. I do not put anything else on my body other than Alatura. It's actually a lie. I use White Oak Pastures beef tallow soap in the shower. But other than that, everything sort of pre, post, around that is Alatura. And if you don't know why... Your skin is the largest organ in your body. It absorbs everything you put on it. And men are less known for using sort of skincare products, but women average over 250 chemicals that are in their bloodstream from their skincare products by the time they walk out the door in the morning. That is ridiculous. 
Uh, I personally use the moisturizer, the clay mask in my sauna, and the pearl cleanser. My fiance uses way more. She has a little bit more of a skincare routine than I. And the products themselves are made with the highest end ingredients that you would ever find in skincare products. This stuff's incredible. Andy himself is a testament how these products work. He's been on the podcast before to tell his story, but it was amazing. He was in a horrific accident. His face got all mangled up and he basically made this formula to heal his scars. And he is now a male model. That is not a joke. He has incredible skin and is obsessed with the quality of his ingredients in the sourcing of them. He was just in Hawaii recently sourcing one ingredient of the many that are in one of his products. This guy goes, visits every single form and product, and it is incredible. The quality you get here is by far the best in the industry. And so I begged him to sponsor the show and also begged him to give you guys a little bit of a hookup. So if you use code AG20, you'll get 20% off in free shipping over at alatura.com. That's AG20 at A-L-I-T-U-R-A to get 20% off your order at alatura.com. That's A-G-20 at A-L-I-T-U-R-A.com. You'll get 20% off in free shipping of your entire order. Again, I use the Pearl Cleanser in the moisturizer. They are phenomenal. Monsel. What? What do you want? Thank you what for you joining me? me today. Oh, we're is, uh, Yeah, we're recording now. Um, <laughs> I'm super excited to get you on. You put me, you said you spammed me in the email flow or what? <laughs> oh, yeah. You sent me a, a marketing email flow? Well, yeah. And I was like, oh, man, we need to get on the podcast to chat about this. <laughs> like, oh, funny enough. Yeah, that flow. I made... A long time ago, but I wanted, I just wanted to give people all the tools to, to start hunting for themselves if they wanted to do that. And I moved you around in my email marketing client into like a different, every list you, you (laughs) could, no, I just put you in a, in a different list alongside, you know, some of the other friends of ours, like Justin, Nat, et cetera, who want to go on like the elk hunting experience and stuff. And, you know, the mishaps that the universe intends to happen. <laughs> yeah. So the email series is about ethical hunting. And I got in hunting last year. I was supposed to go, I don't know if it was the year before. It was the year before. With you yeah. and I like, just moved here. Yep. Um, can't remember what happened, but um, I think I was somewhere else. I was in Austin. But you still are my favorite person when it comes to getting people convinced that hunting is a good thing. And to, that, that there's a different way. I think that there's such generalities right now in life and so many buckets where people take one idea and they say, oh, everything is like that. And so, for example, uh, eating meat you know, this is very tied, very closely tied to hunting. But, oh, I, mean, it's, I guess another way to describe this is that there's this article I read today in the New York Times that some guy said, oh, coronavirus is the end of meat end of eating meat because you know all these tyson and smithfield plants and everything are, everyone's getting sick the animals suck the animals are getting sick they're having to butcher them at mass no one's, no one's eating them like yes commercial farming is terrible and yes that is bad for the environment it doesn't mean all meat production and consumption is also like that i think hunting is another one of these things where people don't realize that there's more nuance to then to to being like a NASCAR wearing, Budweiser drinking, gun toting American out trying to get their trophy hunt. And you approach it in such a way like you're in this generation where you're sort of like bridging the gap between these ethical means of acquiring meat and consuming it, but also the spiritual nature of hunting. So yeah, I I would love to just hear your sort of definition and how you view hunting and how it compares to the norm. Yeah, as you describe it, the the word that comes up for me most is reverence, and it's it's easy to for me to bring reverence into hunting because it's so it's such a glaring emotional aspect of life that we have to kill something in order to survive ourselves, whether that's plants or animals. And 
what I find is that as I've kind of gone down this path with hunting, as I've gone down the path with my own spiritual journey, that it's possible to make anything either sacred or bring reverence to it. And that feels like the most important part of the hunting or the gardening because there's also plenty of, you know, plants and the indigenous people considered like all beings were people. Like they use the term, it's the same term, right. people and beings that are non homo sapiens. And just because we don't understand what plants feel and how they feel doesn't mean that there's not dis trauma created in some capacity, some way, shape or form. And so, yeah, going back to this concept of reverence, that is the most important thing with, with the meat. And you can do that without hunting. I mean, you can have a relationship with a farmer that allows their animals to be, you know, well managed. And I think that there's a lot of reverence that they can show and a deep, deep relationship that they can have with those animals that is reflected in the food as well. Right. So you did not grow up a hunter? Definitely not. I grew up vegetarian, actually. Yeah, I didn't know that. When did you make the switch? Well, I made the switch when I was 20 years old. I started eating meat because I felt better with it. As I was growing up as a vegetarian, I played soccer competitively. I went to Europe to play uh, semi-professionally and swam competitively. So I was like ranked in the state of Texas when I quit swimming. And so pretty high level, and I could not gain weight, no matter how hard I tried. I don't think I ever really got enough protein. I, I just didn't feel my best until I started eating meat in my 20s. And there was somewhere in my mid 20s where it f just felt so weird that I was eating meat and that I felt great with it, but I only thought of restaurants and grocery stores. I never really thought about that this is an actual animal. And that felt so odd to me. It didn't feel wrong necessarily. It just felt odd. And that is kind of what the initial seeds of wanting to hunt uh, were planted. Yeah. And when was your first hunt and how did you get exposed to it? Well, I hunted for the first time a little over two and a half years ago. And honestly... It was just a matter, I only knew one person who hunted personally, and that was Ben Greenfield because I was in a biohacking nootropic space. So I just asked him, he put me in touch with someone. And I very much approached my first hunt from the perspective of just getting uh, connected to the fact that I eat meat and what that actually feels like to, to take a life and learn about it. It was very pragmatic. I had not had any relationship to a higher power or spiritual beliefs or anything like that at the time. So it was just very pragmatic and an interest in getting connected with my food, which I think most people start out that way. And I got very lucky or blessed with a couple of plant medicine experiences very in close proximity to my first hunt that just contextualize the hunt in a completely different way. And I also was lucky and it's interesting to look back at how our lives play out, but rewind to my twenties, I was arrested and eventually spent time in prison and had a felony. On not my, for eating the meat, not for eating meat. <laughs> uh, but I had, so I had a felony on my record, which meant that I couldn't, use a rifle to hunt for my first time. So I had to do archery, which meant I had to be more practiced. I had to put in way more effort into my hunting experience and I had to be way more intimate with the animal when I killed it. I had to be much closer. I had to learn and, you know, be 
uh, a lot more mindful of my natural surroundings because of this you know, poor life choice many, many years prior. And for it was for the best, obviously. Right. And a lot of people don't understand that there's, there's hunting and then there's hunting, you know what I mean? And there's, there's the act of killing the animal and then there's the actual hunting process. And so much goes into it. And this is all the questions I asked you when I first started getting into this stuff. And I'm still very much so a novice, but you know, all the way down from preparing to going out to paying attention to where the wind is blowing and spotting the animals and making the right kill shots and like all these different things play into it. And looking at foot tracks, looking at droppings, like all this stuff is something that we've probably done. Probably we have done all of human history that is so bizarrely connected now that I think that if we just grew up with this as a normal thing, all humans interacted with the responsibility it takes to end an animal's life to then continue your life, which, which is what it is. Like, again, like life comes from life. You can't go outside and eat rocks and expect your life to continue. You need to eat things that are living, regardless if it's plants or animal, like living things need to eat living things. And there's so much that it, it takes to just be aware and present in a way that when I first went was shocking to me. And you seem to be the most in tune person that I've met. And it was just surprising that it's only been two and a half years since you first started doing it. So like that's the first experience you had, you know, you pre preparation, obviously, like where did you learn about this stuff? And like, was it, you, you and Austin just went out or like, how, you just loaded up a bow and just went out and we're lucky or what? Yeah, I, well, I, there was some luck to it. The, uh, the short version I in terms of, uh, the first hunt that I went on was I learned archery and during a plant medicine ceremony, I had a very, very profound experience where I asked a higher power for support in the hunt. And specifically, I just felt like how shitty it would feel to hurt the animal and the fact that I was going to kill the animal. And I just had a vision of the animal and spontaneously started tearing up. You've done, you know, different plant medicines. So, you know, that experience in, in that emotional state. And I asked, please, God, higher power, universe, whatever it is, just have the first shot end the animal's life quickly and cleanly. And of course, I look at these things as a co-created process. So I recognized God's not going to do anything for me necessarily. I have my own responsibility. So I went home and I practiced practiced very rigorously. Archery uh, just became like a, a multi-day, multi-practice uh, per day situation for for weeks at a time. So that's the first step was really like dialing in my, my archery. Yeah. And I think that if you choose to use a rifle, you know, it wasn't an option for you, but I took it just as seriously. And I would, I went out and, you know, dozens of rounds and to, to make sure that I was proficient with the firearm. And it, like, I don't, I don't think anybody thinks who takes hunting seriously in this way. It's not fun to kill something. No, I've had some of my most emotional trying like traumatic it has literally created trauma in the standard textbook definition of the word trauma in my body that i felt viscerally for months after the fact i mean what were some of these experiences the first experience that i had with a whitetail deer i i shot him and with archery often times what happens is the arrow will ricochet off of of bone and it ricocheted off of the top of his rib cage up into his spine mm. and so what happens then is you don't actually hit any of the vitals but because it's hit the spine he can't move anywhere and so in that situation he was his the top part of his body is his front legs were trying to move and his back legs and back part of his body just wasn't moving. And so he was literally writhing around and I had to think quickly and I didn't think quickly enough, but 
after a few moments of, of intense emotions, just took out my knife and I went and I don't recommend this for beginners, but I uh, grabbed his antlers to make sure he wouldn't gore me with, with the antlers. And then I put the knife under his shoulder into his heart. And I remember looking at him, you know, almost as close as the microphone in front of my face and just looking at him in the eyes and just saying, I'm sorry, everything's going to be okay. Everything's going to be okay. And it was, it was, you know, both brutal in the, in one sense. Uh, it was beautiful in another sense. It was, so I was, I was proud. I was grieving. I, I was, um, you know, grateful for the meat. And that was, you know, one of, one of many experiences that have been very challenging emotionally. Right. And I think that it's, I didn't have any sort of concept for this before I had my first kill as well. And it's like, it's so strange because it is such a mix of emotions and there are such primal emotions that come up that you don't expect. And it's not fun, like I said, but it's almost, it is exciting to a certain degree. And I imagine that there's some primal wiring here where likely is very unlucky to, you know, it probably wasn't very easy to kill animals throughout all of human history. Like when you did, it goes, oh man, the tribe can eat, we're gonna survive this sort of exhilaration, which is, which is felt, but also the sorrow, like you said, grieving, it's heavy, it's emotional. And I think that, I mean, I already took things very seriously from the standard of like where I get my food and how I treat you know, my relationship with it and everything. But after that, it's just been so radically different. And you, I think, have had a similar appreciation for food and where you get stuff and how much of the animal you use, et cetera. And so I'm just curious as far as how that's changed over the last couple of years. Yeah, the first hunt that I went on, it was from then till now, it's actually grown tremendously. So I agree with you. There's a huge, there's a huge change in one's perspective, just going from zero to one, so to speak, going from having no intimacy with the death to killing an animal. And then, and it's not for everybody, but for me, it's been very much the major pathway for me to deepen my relationship with myself, deepen my relationship with the planet and deepen my spiritual practice because it is such a range of emotions and because it's so deeply embedded in us. Yeah. I mean, literally the first, we, we talk about humans being storytellers. The first stories that were ever told in human or pre-human uh, species was the stories of tracking an animal, right? You look at, you before humans could talk, I mean, they weren't humans. It was, you know, our ancestors, uh, Homo erectus, Homo habilis, et cetera, or even before that. They were looking at footprints in the ground and detecting when they were there and where they were. That's, that's a form of storytelling. Those are the first you know, stories. And so this is like beyond homo sapiens. This is deeper in us than we can even imagine. And that, that makes it such a important and fertile ground for all the different things that I mentioned, like a deeper spiritual practice, a deeper uh, relationship to food, deeper relationship to death and, and things like that. Yeah. I mean, how, how has that changed practically for you speaking in your day-to-day -day life? Well, for one thing, I, there's many things that kind of intersect for one thing, hunting and my experience hunting has, I've wanted a framework for what, what I could, uh, what context I could put hunting into. And I didn't, and I think like many people, I didn't find a lot of resonance with the stereotypical hunting culture of what we see in America or what we see in the world in, in you know, the Western world. 
And so that led me to a lot deeper relationship with indigenous cultures and the indigenous cultures relationship. It's kind of a circular relationship where the hunting practice has led me to more indigenous cultures. The indigenous cultures have led me to a deeper hunting practice. And really there's the, 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 the gratitude piece is probably one of the bigger pieces, whether it's gratitude for the food that I eat, but also just like all the plants and all of the, the living beings that surround us. And I know that sounds kind of woo woo, but to make it practical, like I, I know more species and plants and what the plants are doing and what they should look like at certain times and what they shouldn't look like and when to harvest them and all that, all of the things that I've just picked up from being in tune with it that I wouldn't have had if it weren't for those experiences hunting. Because like you said, in order to... In order to hunt properly, you have to know all these things. That's one way of putting it, right? You have to know about the wind. You have to know about the what the trees are doing and all these kinds of things. But another way of looking at it at a more spiritual level is you have to know the language of Earth in order to be able to like truly listen to what she's saying. Right. And if we're taking from Earth, because we all are doing that, and you can't listen to what she's saying, then it's like being in a relationship with a woman or a man where you speak different languages. It's like, you're not going to get your needs met. You're not going to be able to have a deep relationship with her. Yeah. I mean, it's, this is like, I think division that we have now culturally where people are so far removed. think that we're not a part of this planet, like every other thing that's living and that, I mean, you look around and everything that we can see in our sight, like, trash cans and this water bottle, like everything was harvested from the earth and created and like everything is using materials from the earth. And so for people to say like, Oh, like you're, you're doing this terrible thing by killing this animal, but they're a typical American consumer and all their rights, even if they eat meat or not is, is so incredibly hypocritical. And I think having that connection is just something that I mean, I don't blame a lot of people for doing that. It's ignorance. Yeah, it's just you, you, the, the lack of exposure and how we're born and our relationship to the earth now is just so wildly disconnected. And like you said, like some of the stuff you start talking about it and can sound to people. And this is where I, I'm trying to figure out a way to communicate this stuff without, like you said, it sounds you know woo-woo and whatever. And these are the last things that people need to hear who are ignorant of this connection. It's sort of like when I first started hearing a meditation, I was like, oh, I got it. Okay. Like whatever, right. You're going to like be this hippie in the woods and like floating and with your cross legs and whatever. Yeah. And then I just kept getting bludgeoned with it and then understood the practical elements of like, oh, it can help me work or do X, Y, Z. And then I got into it. And that's like been one of the many, many things that have changed in my life over the last 10 years. I'm trying to understand, like we use with meditation, these areas to hook people who really actually need it right. and create a path. Do you have any idea of like how to get people on this? I don't know if you call it a spiritual path back to connect it to the, to the earth and nature, nature in general. Like how do we, how do we do this? Yeah. Well, one of the things that I've found that is, I mean, it's, it's, I think very, easy to describe is just we have to eat every single day like we have uh, well i mean granted you can do extended fasting and all that kind of stuff but f the, f the sustenance is such a great opportunity for us because we have to do it as part of our biological needs and it, it, it can be such a great opportunity for us to just feel more happy more fulfilled and more grateful and as with anything in life, anybody who's listening to this, doesn't matter how type A, how rational minded they are, if you've done something where you had to put in a lot of work, where you've had to, let, let's say a business and you've had to like really, really sacrifice and really put in a lot of hours, how much more fulfilling is it at the end when you're successful or when you appreciate, would look back and appreciate something? And that is, exactly what hunting 
does and can be a gateway for, but to an even deeper level because it's so rooted in our DNA. If you, especially with archery, but even with, with a rifle, if you go and you practice months before and you're thinking about this hunt and you're preparing for it and you go out and you have memories to recall about the hunt when you're eating food, all of that adds so much value and so much gratitude to the experience right. that it's like a drug. It's, you know, it's like you've just taken a pill and you feel amazing. Like MDMA just, it's, it feels like so much love and so much enjoyment from it. You know, I, I, obviously I don't have the same physiological response, but I have a completely different response to the food that I eat. And you see it, you see it when I bring food that I've hunted or fished myself. I can't stop talking about it. I can't stop sharing it with people. I can't stop, you know, sharing about the experience of it. And it brings so much joy to me. So even if you don't want the spiritual stuff or you're not ready for that, if you just see the joy that can come from doing something yourself, then there's value there. Right. What about for people who maybe aren't ready for hunting or getting into it, or maybe feel like this is too much of a stretch right now, maybe analogous to, okay, I'm hearing about meditation, but I don't want to go on a meditation retreat. Yeah, it's just like seems too much. Like, What are some other ways that people can just get reconnected back to nature. I mean, you're like one of my favorite people in the world when it comes to this, where like you, you are so observant. I mean, before we recorded like an hour or so before, I was like, Hey, Mazel, what's this bird over here? And you just knew immediately. I mean, it's very basic, but I mean, it's like, I knew you would know no matter what. And you've gone like, you're very inspiring to me in a way where you're very connected to nature and everything like in a cyclical way. And it's curious as far as like, if you have any advice for people who are maybe not ready for a hunt, but want to get into understanding plants and connection and getting back to more of a ancestral way to view the world. Mm. Well, there's obviously the, 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 I would say the easy way could be, um, the way that's a little bit more in line with where we all kind of came from in civilization. What I mean by that is just like actually learning, you know, get the, every, Every location has a, a different variety of plants and species and things like that. And you can just get books and you can just start to learn by looking and going out on plant walks and things like that. That's a very, that's a very um, easy way to get started. But I feel like to really, to, to really take it, to another level is is just is to really get into the feeling space. <laughs> I have to go there again. Um, but for people to like go out and spend time in some type of unadulterated nature, it doesn't have to be like a state park. It doesn't. It could even just be a park, and just try and feel like what it's like. And I'm not talking about like feelings, like emotions or whatever like that. I mean, just like feel what it's like in your body to be in nature and notice that difference. I think that's one of the first things is to just like get in touch with the feeling of how much better it is in nature and then kind of follow follow yeah. those, those, those trails, so to speak. Yeah. I mean, I, I usually feel way more calm and like my brain races much less than if I were to be inside. And it's like likely so many things that intersect to add to that sort of feeling. Um, it's, yeah, I mean, it's just interesting. You, you also seem to be a person which can, you, you can, say enough's enough. And like, you always say that you just like basically want to work and get work to, done so you can go like be outside or like go hunting or learn stuff and like just be with nature. Like, have you always been that way where you've been, it's been very easy for you to step outside of this like sort of box that we live in the society and be like, oh, okay. I meant to be outside. Like that's my priority and screw all the other stuff. It's just like a means to get there. No, I have not. I've historically been quite bad at that, actually. And it's like, you're this guy too, who like also track your time in a really crazy way with tags and like this, I mean, yeah. <laughs> you go into like, you're very much so like 
productivity nerd, but then also to the other side of that, you can still be a person who, you know, is, is really connected to nature and wants to get out there. Yeah. It's like, how do you balance those things? And how do you think about that as far as each side of a coin there? Yeah. Well, I think I got very lucky with my experience in prison and I don't, have to go into that too much, but there is something unique about losing your freedom completely about having no possessions, no control over anything that made me definitely question what my values are, what I'm capable of, what I, what makes me happy, what creates meaning and fulfillment for me. And so after I, after I had that experience to draw back on, it, it, it's it's just been you know wisdom that I've been able to like pull out when I needed to. But I I spent years in my early twenties, mid twenties, where I was, uh, I think probably very similar to most people. In I had career priorities and I was bludgeoning my body and my brain in order to try and reach those. But ultimately, what I've found with introspection is just how much, how much those motivations were coming from a place that was oriented in some type of someone else's story. And, you know, if we're running, if we're if we're running our lives based on story, the story of someone else, whether that's a person like, you know, our parent or civilization, that's like a form of malware. That's like we're running some other program. Right. I mean, if you open up your laptop, it's a MacBook and the windows launch, but what the hell is this? Yeah. You, yeah, like you would want to fix that. Right. But we just don't even question that stuff when it happens in our, in our brain, in our life. Exactly. Yeah. And so I start to realize this, and this is still a practice. I mean, you know, I've still got, I've still got all those emotions and all those shadows that show up and I just have to kind of keep them in front of me, but I've gotten a lot clearer in what my values are and, and really I've gotten, I, I think a lot of it's actually kind of common sense is, uh, is, is I've gotten really good at following my feelings, if that makes sense, in the sense that it feels good to me to spend a lot of time with people that I love and enjoy connecting with. It feels good to be outside in nature and have a mission, which is to like feed myself and my family hunting or fishing. It feels good to know about my surroundings. It feels good to have a relationship with all these plants. Again, back to the woo, but fuck it, we're going to go there. Like I, last week I had, I think I shared this with you. I was inspired by an anthropologist who had worked with indigenous people for, for decades. And one of the things he said was the indigenous people don't really separate like humans from plants and animals and things like that. They're, it's all just living beings. And when I could tap into that before I had a meal last week and just like had a conversation basically with my cats and had like some point of connection where I was just like, good job to this plant you're trying, but you're struggling right now. I'll get you some more water. Wow. You guys don't need a lot of support, blah, blah, blah. It sounds so silly, but like, I feel so connected. I feel so the opposite of alone. I live alone. I'm in my house alone, but I feel so opposite of that. And that feels so good. And I follow that feeling. That's the biggest point is like, I'm following the feelings. And when I clear out the malware of like, what society and the civilization wants of me, then it's much easier to just kind of follow that. And we both share a love for the book Civilized to Death. He talks about all the ways that humans are basically subservient in civilization, subservient to growing the GDP or subservient to, you know, growing some other metric that we choose to value that the individual doesn't actually get all that much benefit from. Right. We're, we're just caught in this trap 
of doing things because society does things. And yeah, I mean, this is just, I've done some thought experiments, especially over the last couple of months with quarantine and lockdown. I'm like, okay, this went even more extreme and city of Austin broke down. We had to flee out to the middle of nowhere. Like maybe started banding together some people and like really kind of recreating in a modern world, a, a, tribal society like where you're out in like the middle of nowhere because like i don't think it, it, social breakdown you can't be safe in the city like what would be a good day like what, what would like like today i look back I'm like okay i got this thing done i guess answer these emails whatever and like i know i feel good about myself like what would actually be a good day and that's more consistent with how a human probably should live and a lot of things you mentioned before, like their relationships, being outside, being connected to other loving things, getting something to eat, like not working physically too hard, but physically being some, somewhat physically spent. And these are all the things that you just said. And in the, that book as well, it's like chatting a lot about like, okay, what has been historically what satisfied humans for the longest time? Like, are we surprised now that the rate of depression is so high, suicide so high, like anxiety is through the roof. People are just like uh, torturing themselves and don't even realize they're in this soup of society that it's controlling everything they're doing. Yeah. It's, it's, it's actually, yeah, I think it's really, it's really simple. And, and <laughs> well, I guess there's some empathy still for like the, the systems that we have in place, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's a lot of people are also trapped in it. Right. I mean, we're fortunate where we can have this conversation and sort of think about these things, but people have bills to pay and ha have a job that like everything used to, everything that you need as a human used to be free and abundant relatively. Now we've extracted it where everything you like, you have to get a job to pay for the things that used to be free that we socially provided for each other, namely clothing and shelter and food. That's all you really needed. Yeah. All of human history is all you really need now too. Yet we abstract it and say, okay, we're like, we're really going to do this diversification thing and specialization. And like, we're going to have this food system, provide the food. We're going to have, you know, landlords provide the buildings and stuff that you live in, but like, you have to go get a job and provide for, for value for the society. And then you can have these things that you need to live and survive. Yeah. And it's even, it's even worse now than it was at other times when agriculture was prevalent. I mean, right. you don't have to go all the way back to the indigenous, like hunter gatherers to, to recognize how bad it's gotten because it's almost like I talk about my own like spiritual relationship. It wasn't that long ago where the church was a relatively good source of spiritual guidance of answering yeah. questions that were in the ephemeral and being a, a source of inspiration for people. And we've literally re like consumerism has swallowed religion, has swallowed spirituality and is, you know, propped up by science and technology. And these are all like very nominally, rational things yeah there's not a lot of intuition and feeling space uh, like uh, available there and not only swallowed those things but also has made it made health which is what i think to be very simple actually extremely hard and complex like i just emailed out recently about how how difficult it is actually like when you like I have this house in austin all of the things i need to do to this house to make it be an environment where it's not making me sick is absurd where that comes under like the air quality the stuff used in the paint in my house, the like water filtration, because you can't get water. There's like, weird chemicals in it from the city, like on and on and on and on. And like even just thinking recently about how, again, not too long ago, 100 years ago, maybe 80 years ago, 50 years ago, you'd be able to travel to any anywhere, horse and buggy. You could roll around and you'd, you'd roll across some small town. You could trust that if you ate food, it would be nourishing for you. And if, it, if, if food was available at all, it'd be nourishing for you, whatever form it came in. Now, if I go to a small town, I'm like, it's literally impossible here to acquire food that is fit for a human. And let alone like, 
uh, let's say a hotel room, lights that are crazy bright, like water quality, flame retardants and everything that's in the, that are in there. And so like, if I go to a small town now, it's like literally impossible to be healthy. Yeah. Unless I set up a tent and go hunting by myself. Yeah. It's, 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 it's funny because it's like all of that is in the relentless pursuit of progress. Right. It's like, and there's a really great, there's a really great, uh, philosopher, thinker, you know, Nick Bostrom. So Nick Bostrom has the whole artificial intelligence metaphor, basically, where he creates what's called like a a paperclip maximizer. Have you heard this? Yeah. And so it, you know, basically the long, the long story short is this AI is basically using all the substrate like metal to make paper clips great then the ai runs out of metal so they start using other materials and eventually the ai starts using human beings to make paper clips because we've programmed the ai to make paper clips this is like a dystopian future where ai has this like single minded yeah. task and it just literally destroys humanity we're already doing that that's what a relentless pursuit towards like higher GDP, more growth, et cetera. That's what it, we're doing. And so it's reflected in like how we create our environments and, you know, Native American peoples, uh, Native, indigenous peoples all over the world, they like, they didn't separate art from life. Like it was, everything was all together. So like where they lived, where they lived was like beautiful. It was artistic. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes it was alive. And now it's like we, because of what we're interested in as far as a civilization, it's kind of bifurcated completely where you have to be super mindful if you want to be inhabiting a, a healthy place. Yeah. I mean, this is the question that I just keep asking myself and pondering and using this podcast to explore uh, is like how there's all these different facets to health and nutrition is obviously one that I've covered a dramatic degree, but there's such like a social connection to both other people in the planet and nature. And it's the, the question I'm trying to figure out is like, how do we get back to resembling anything that looks like what it should so that way it doesn't have to be so goddamn hard to just exist in and not have to think about, oh, I need to get a walk in with my friend today because I know that walking with another human being is good for X, Y, and Z reason. We need to have a scientific study done and RCT done and like walking and being outside to show that it's good for how, like, yeah. it's just ridiculous. And like, it ends up being infinite amount of boxes to check that are impossible. It's right. like, I mean, we just chatted recently about like co-housing stuff. And like, is that an answer? Like, like, like where are the, the lines where you can still live a life and not be outcast from society, but not have to play the game, so to speak, and then check all these boxes about trying like, desperately to be healthy. Yeah. You have any answers? I don't <laughs> <laughs> think about it. No, I, I don't have any answers. And to me, it's we i think a lot of us you i'm sure i definitely started this journey thinking about all of this in the through the lens of like what i was eating that's kind of where i started i think a lot of people start there and i thought about it from the perspective of like a paleo diet yeah the irony is is like that's not the paleo diet's not actually I mean, sorry to burst some people's bubbles, but it's not actually like what Paleolithic man ate. And it's not, it's not, it's a great start, but it's not far enough. Right. And so, you know, learning and, and embodying these principles and kind of moving to a life that is in, in the way you've described, it's not always a linear process. It's not always that you just are gonna constantly be progressing towards it, it's often very cyclical. And so as I come back to, or as in the last couple of years, I came back to a more like ancestral approach, I just took that paleo diet concept and just like went a little bit deeper. Well, what would it be like if I actually like consumed animals that I, you know, took part in killing myself? And then, well, what do other indigenous people do? So, I mean, the point of me bringing that up is like the more that you can look at 
a template from the perspective of where we came from, I think the better off you're going to be because I, w- I always find it so interesting where people who are defending like 5G, they're like, where are the studies that show 5G is bad? I'm like, the the burden of proof is not on us to show that 5G is safe or not. Right. The, the burden of proof is on the new technology that we've not had for tens and hundreds of thousands of years of our species. So like start with the thing that we've been doing for tens and hundreds of thousands of years as a little bit of a template and then kind of progress from there. And I mean, that's kind of a simple way of answering it, but where I would add some complexity to it is we're really good at viewing the practical and creating like lists. They ate this, they didn't eat this, they ate like this, they didn't eat like this. But we're really, we're really hard at trying to replicate the feelings. And there is undoubtedly a way that indigenous people were more fulfilled had more meaning in their lives, had more happiness, had more connection. And we have to start like looking at those things more carefully and coming from a feeling space because I mean, there's plenty of, there's plenty of studies that show like people who have some kind of religious or spiritual uh, practice are way happier, way less depression, way less anxiety, et cetera. I'm not saying religion's the answer, but I'm saying there's things that are ephemeral that are hard to quantify, hard even to explain or describe, such as like connection to the land. What does that even really mean at a statistical or, you know, what does that really mean in a practical terms? It's hard to describe, but there's something there that's super, super fucking important that if we neglect it and just do the things that we can quantify, we're not going to get the whole picture. Yeah, we'll never have that information either. And like, by the time we have all that information, we weren't we weren't going to be humans anyways. Right. And this is just sort of like how I think about things and just questioning like, okay, what do I want to get out of life? I want to be happy. I want to be healthy. I want to have meaning. And I want to help other people around me have that same thing. So instead of trying to think about all this stuff from a scientific point of view, like I had done a lot of my life previously, I'm thinking about, okay, we're, well, I am sort of this, like no one chose to be alive in this the time that they're alive. It just happens and you're gifted with it. And that's something you have to deal with. And so just looking at like, okay, I have a certain biology and genetics that I can't change. And looking at the past and learning from the past of, okay, if that's the case and all other humans in the past that had this same thing, what are the, what are the key things like to get you there? Instead of trying to fix it with things in the future, and make something up, why not just go to the wisdom that's been there forever and take that and then port that to modern day and live in that. And it's like, there's a lot of interlapping, a lot of weirdness when it, you interconnect those things to be like the guy with a ponytail living out in the woods barefoot. Everyone thinks a freak and like you get judged and you actually have an opposite effect because now you're, you're, you're Ryan. an outcast. Yeah. yeah. And it's, yeah, I mean, this is the thing. Like, speaking of nutrition, you're you're right. It's it's impossible now, relatively speaking, to eat how a paleo man used to actually eat, getting wild animals, foraging for food. Like, you can do it, sure, if you go like buy land out of the middle of nowhere and do that and like set that up as your thing. But also, just like if you want to go to your butcher shop and get good quality meat and like eat sort of plants or seasonal at farmers markets, like that's good enough good enough for now you know there's so many things to optimize for and i'm trying to think of like all of these things like oh that's good enough for now to like bring that back like you don't need to get all the way back you may get a good point about like religion and meaning and like communal groups spirituality like, these things all existed we don't have the technology to help us figure out why the hell we're here what humans are what consciousness is what the universe is et cetera. Like, yeah, we're, we're trying, but like, we don't have the answers. Like, I think that until we do, we need some sort of spirituality to make sense of things and create meaning and belonging. It's sort of a map of how to live life in the world. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of unanswered questions here. 
Oh yeah. Tons of unanswered questions. And I think that's actually where the beauty is because so much of our civilization is based on materialism, like what we can quantify, what we can touch, what we can measure. And I always say, well, within the past couple of years, I've always considered myself to be a recovering materialist because that line of thinking, that line, that like tunnel vision of what we can quantify is so a misguided be a source of a lot of personal suffering and see ultimately not uh, helpful for the planet. What like what we can't quantify now we discard. We right. don't, we don't consider. And then 10 years from now we realize that we can actually quantify it and we just discarded it because we didn't quantify it for a certain period of time. Right. So that's where it's like, I told you before the podcast, when people share things about that, I don't fully like buy into my perspective is mu I feel much healthier when my perspective is like, Oh wow, that's interesting. I don't, I don't know whether you're, you're, you're right or wrong about that woo woo thing, but I have, <laughs> speaking of technology yeah. and modern <laughs> civilization, um, but I have an openness to it that feels uh, healthier because, so, I mean, a perfect example, I'll give you an example. With hydroelectric dams, for so long, everybody thought like this is the f this is the form of energy that's so great. We're going to create all this free energy. It's not fossil fuels and all this kind of stuff. And this is very much an argument of like, you know, more progressive type people. And what happens when you dam up a river is the fish, salmon specifically, that need to swim upstream can no longer swim upstream. And if they can no longer swim upstream, then the bears that are on the other side of the dams can't eat the salmon. And if those bears can't eat the salmon, then they have no source of nitrogen in their diet. The salmon bring the nitrogen from the ocean inland. The bears eat the salmon. The bears poop is nitrogen rich, it enriches the ground, it, it enriches the trees, and it prevents those trees from igniting on fire. And that is one of the main causes, according to many scientists, of the significant forest fires that we see in California and much of the West. And it's very challenging for us to quantify it, but if 20 years ago we thought that we knew everything, and then we set this up. Well, it turned out we were wrong. So what are we wrong about now that we're going to look back on and wonder? And I think it's a lot of things. So I just have gone a different path. Yeah. Try to keep learning, man. That's all you can really do is like, and that's what's exciting about it. And that's why I'm pumped up every time I wake up in the morning because I get to dig into the stuff and tiny little nooks and crannies I haven't explored before. Um, all right, man. I appreciate it. And yeah, if you want to send people the information regarding the spam hunting <laughs> newsletter or like, you know, it's like, I, I don't know how many emails you have on this, but basically it walks you through like if, if you've never hunted before, here's everything you need to know in a very responsible way. Um, so I don't know if you can send that, or you can put it in the show notes. Sure. Yeah. And then anywhere else you want to send people. Yeah. So I have, uh, the website's sacredhunting.com and I have distilled for, for people who just want to get started and want something like super quick and digestible, I have a, just a checklist. So I distilled a lot of that information into, into a checklist. So just go to sacredhunting.com and there's an opt-in form. You can, you can uh, put in your email and get a checklist. And then there's a series of emails afterwards that break down basically how to get into hunting and uh, in an ethical way. And I personally see it very much through the lens of Native American cultures. I have a lot of relationships with uh, Native American cultures. I have a spiritual teacher and mentor. And I bring that into the hunting context because I find it adds so much flavor and so much of the ethical piece 
that is oftentimes missing from the more like Western approach to hunting. Cause I'll, I'll give you just, just, uh, after this truck drives by, I'll give you a, just like a super quick, like history note that I think is relevant when Europeans moved to North America, to the United States in Europe, they were not allowed to hunt. So for hundreds of years, thousands of years, the nobility and the kings prevented common people from mm -hmm. hunting because they owned the land and they monopolized the hunting privileges. So when the, the Americans came or when the Anglos came to America, they didn't have a hunting culture. And so what we see now is kind of a very new and in some ways ill-informed uh, hunting culture. And what the Native Americans had was a very, very rich culture that had been uh, cultivated for tens of thousands of years. And so as that's older and as that's more enmeshed with their perspective on, on life and, and their surroundings, I incorporate that a lot more. And I think it resonates with a lot of people who are you know, from the cities and never hunted before. Yeah. Is there any, are there any spots left open on the elk hunt? There are two spots left on the elk hunt, the intermediate hunt in November. Yeah, one I should be on, but I'm planning to get married during that time. Um, hopefully that can still happen given... Well, I said there's two spots. So if you and Martha want to come, I'd be happy to have you. Let's do the ceremony there. <laughs> <laughs> cool, Absolutely. man. Uh, and you have a podcast anywhere else you want to send people? Yeah, if, uh, if they want to listen to my podcast, it's the Mon Monsal Denton podcast. And, you know, I've had guests like... Dennis McKenna and, and some really interesting thinkers where I've been kind of exploring a lot of the same themes we talked about today, which is just how do we, how do we live a life of meaning and fulfillment and live well when our surroundings don't always optimize for it. Yeah, brother. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of the natural state podcast. Hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, I'd really appreciate you heading over to whatever service you're listening to this podcast on, dropping me a five-star review and your thoughts on the show. This helps us get discovered by more people and spreading the good gospel of health. And if you want to stay plugged into all of my self-health experiments, recent research in books that I'm reading and my interpretations of those things, products that I'm testing and thoughts on all things related to health, check out my free weekly newsletter called The Feed. You can sign up for that at dranthonygustin.com slash the feed. That's dranthonygustin.com slash the feed. Thanks again for tuning in and your support of the Natural State Podcast.